I'm Moisha. Um, I'm a principal engineer at MailChimp. Uh, I realized this summer that I've been writing code for money for about 30 years now, which kind of blew my mind. Um, I've worked at all sorts of places. Um, and today, as Camille said, I want to talk about technical interviews. So I'm going to start with this quote. I'm not going to really say anything about it. I'll just let you read it. But I hope it sort of frames the talk. Now, one thing, just to get out of the way, uh, I regret to inform you that I do not have all the answers. Uh, interviewing is complicated, it involves people, and it's just intrinsically like amorphous and hard. Uh, there's no magic bullet, and there is no one-size-fits-all solution for interviewing. Um, and in this talk, I'm mostly going to leave implementation details as an exercise for you all. So we sort of need to embrace that ambiguity together. So I want to give a little bit of background about myself just to sort of frame the talk. Um, my first real introduction to sort of intentional interviewing was at Google around 2006. Um, I did about 250 interviews while I was there. Uh, I was on hiring committee for six years, and like just briefly to describe what hiring committee is, uh, basically the way interviewing worked at Google, I'm not sure if it still is this way, but in 2006, is uh, a candidate would come on site, uh, they'd have six interviews, uh, each of those interviewers would write up uh, about a page and a half or so of written feedback about how the interview went. Um, and give a numerical score between one, which was basically, if you hire this person, I'll quit, and four, which was, if you don't hire this person, I'll quit. Uh, so all that, um, all that written feedback and the numbers were put together into a packet with some other information, like the resume, like if it was a new grad, their college GPA, stuff like that. And that was sent to hiring committee. So all the information we had on hiring committee was the written feedback from interviewers. Um, and based on that, we made a hire, no hire decision. It was a really educational experience for me being on hiring committee. Like, A, I, I like to joke sort of that I got my CS 101 education by reading interview packets because I learned all these algorithms that people used. Um, but also, like, it gave me some, like, a pretty broad insight into how people do interviews, what they look for. That's like um, maybe the pathologies of them and the good parts of them at the same time. Um, so I did that. I, was also, I also taught interview training for about five years while I was at Google. And that was, um, Google had a basically prescribed syllabus. So I was teaching to a syllabus. It wasn't my own. But that was also a very educational experience. These were workshops that were very interactive. I got to hear a lot about people's past interview experiences and so on. But like honestly, my main takeaway from this was in the process of actually being an interviewer, I learned that I really like loved it. Like I really enjoyed talking to people in interviews, which surprised me as an introverted engineer. Um, and while I was there, like I was definitely fully bought into Google's methods. Um, like we all knew they weren't perfect, but it it also felt like sort of the best solution we had. Uh, and I think like looking back on it and introspecting, like this is about me, not about anybody else. But I think for me, there was a little bit of elitism, right? Like, I got to be in this special club by getting through, like, what felt maybe a little bit like a trial by fire. And, like, if I had to go through that, then, like, it makes sense that everybody else should also to be a member of the special club I was in. And, like, I also want to frame that by, like, a couple times in this talk, I might have some minor critiques of Google's interview process circa 2006. Um, uh, they're old, like that's outdated information, and like that's not the focus of this talk. And anything I say about that process, like I really say with love, like I had a really great time working there and have nothing but respect. So just to frame that. All right, so I'm going to skip ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, so after Google, I went to uh, Etsy in 2013. Um, this is clearly not Etsy's corporate logo. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but I, I learned two things there about interviewing, which were sort of like way outside the bounds of the things I'd learned at Google. Um, the first one was I was a hiring manager for about a year there. And that gave me a very, very different insight into what it means to interview and to have sort of the authority to decide yes, no for a given candidate. Um, at Google, everything was consensus. At Etsy, it was your decision. Um, and that like 
I think made me place a lot more weight on interviews when it was me making a choice. Um, it also let me see what happened when we hired people. Um, I think like we got extremely lucky that like we hired three incredible people onto the team, and they all were able to sort of amplify the team as a whole in in orthogonal ways and in ways that were like surprising to me, even though I'd interviewed them. There were things that I couldn't predict from the interview. The other thing I did at Etsy was um, I actually taught interview classes with my friend Tim, and Tim had this amazing metaphor in the classes we taught, which he called mapping the potato. So you can think of like, you could think of a candidate's skills and knowledge and traits, et cetera, as defining some sort of lumpy spheroid in n-dimensional space. And your job as an interviewer then is to probe in various directions in like n space until you find the limits of their knowledge. Um, so like you could imagine that one interviewer might try to figure out how, how much a candidate knows about networking and ask a bunch of questions about that, and you're sort of going off in this direction. And another interviewer might ask, uh, or might try to figure out how good they are communicating, and that's a different direction. Um, and then you sort of total all these things up, or whatever, you don't add them, but you map them, and you get this lumpy spheroid. Uh, so you can sort of think, use that to think about like how you tailor interviews to, to probe certain areas. And the other thing that's kind of magic about this is when you hit that boundary, you also get to see how a candidate does when they don't know the answer to something, which, like, in my opinion, is one of the fundamental questions of engineering, right? Like, I definitely spend all day, every day, not knowing what the hell I'm doing and having to figure it out. And I don't think that's, I hope that's not unique. Um, so, potatoes. Uh, I'm gonna fast forward now, about two and a half years, into the future. And uh, to frame this, I wanna talk about my hobby, which is like every weird dad's dream. I've got a whole room filled with people I get to talk to about my hobby. Uh, I love photography. This is a picture I took at Great Sand Dunes in Colorado. Um, I've been doing photography since I was six. I had a dark room, like I'm super duper into it. Um, and this past summer in August, I took a class from Kathy Opie, this woman here. Um, Kathy's a professor at UCLA. She's an incredibly well-known photographer. Her work is amazing. And like, it was, like I was terrified and super honored to be able to take a class from her. So on the first day of class, we did portfolio review. And if you've never done this, it's basically choose a dozen or so of your images that like maybe are of a type or speak to something you want to do during this class. And this was a portrait photography class. So uh, we get to my images. I have them laid out on the table like this. Kathy's next to me and I'm talking about them. Like I go through each image, describe it. And at the end I said, you know, um, I'm super interested in portrait photography because I think it's, it has an analog to a thing that I'm very interested in at work, which is interviewing. Um, and I think there's something really neat about constructing an artificial environment where you discover something true about a person. Now, like, I thought I was being so smart. Like, I thought I was being so smart. <laughs> and Kathy sort of stepped back from the table. She looked me in the eye, and like, Kathy's amazing. She's the nicest person you'll ever meet. But she also, I think because of growing up in the Midwest and her role as a professor, uh, has a very direct bluntness to her. And she looked me in the eye and she was just like, you know what, you're talking about essentialism and that's not real. <laughs> so the rest of the portfolio review in the class went great, the class was amazing, but like this lodged in my head and I could not stop thinking about it. Uh, so like right after portfolio review, I found a paper online called Essential Non-Essentialism and tried to muddle through that. And I'm a lousy scholar. Um, and then like started discovering some other, like maybe scratching the surface of postmodern philosophy. And like, I'm not gonna teach myself postmodern philosophy in a few weeks or a couple of months, but I think I was able to wrap my head around the core of what she was getting at, which is this. Earlier I described the idea of mapping a potato. But the problem is there isn't a potato. There's not some idealized map 
of a candidate that exists discrete from everything else in the universe. The only potato is the potato that you, as an interviewer, and the candidate define together. So I want to go back to photography, and specifically portrait photography, to describe what I mean. When you photograph a person, you're not capturing something essential about them. You're creating with them a representation of the interaction you had during that portrait. So there's as much you in every portrait as there is the subject. So I'm going to tell you a little story about this. This is the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. If you watch The Crown, you might know who they are. Um, briefly, uh, the guy on the right uh, is Edward VIII, and he abdicated his throne to marry the woman on the left, Wallace Simpson. Um, and obviously, you don't give up the throne without some feelings about it. But if you look at most photographs of this couple, they're like stylish, maybe wistful, but like not unhappy. And they were very good at being stylish. This is Richard Avedon. Uh, he was one of the most influential fashion and fine art portrait photographers of the 20th century. He had this split career where he made his money doing fashion photography. He photographed for Harper's Bazaar and Vogue and ultimately The New Yorker. Um, but the other half of his career was doing these incredible portraits. Um, and his portraits are challenging. If you've never seen them, I definitely encourage you to, to look for them. I think there's even some at MoMA next door. Um, they're not generally pretty, but they feel true. So something about Avedon you should know is he was Jewish. And there's another thing you should know. The Duke and Duchess of Windsor were Nazi sympathizers. This is them with Hitler. Uh, even during World War II, they were pro-fascist. Um, another fact about them is they loved dogs. They were super into their pugs. They had Cartier leashes for their pugs. Uh, they um, used Miss Dior perfume on their pugs. Uh, they would like dress them in mink, and so on. So Avedon made an appointment to take a portrait of the Duke and Duchess of Windsor. And his goal might have been to capture something essential about them, but that thing had to be filtered through who Avedon was. So he got there 15 minutes late which is already kind of a power move with royalty. Right? <laughs> um, but Avedon could get away with it because of who he was. So he started photographing them. And being royalty and being used to being photographed, they were their usual stylish selves. Uh, if you look at, for instance, this earlier photograph from the shoot, you can see this pretty clearly. Uh, but this wasn't what Avedon wanted. So he wound his Roloflex to the next frame. Roloflex is a, it's called a, a twin lens reflex camera. You look down into it to focus and frame, but you're not behind the camera. You can see the person you're photographing. The shutter release in his hand, he said, you know, by the way, I am super sorry that I was late, but on the way here, my taxi ran over and killed a dog. So this story is kind of an outlier. Like most of his portraits don't involve this level of subterfuge. Like most portraits don't. Although there are other examples, like if you Google Karsh and Churchill, you'll, you'll be able to read another fun story. Um, but every portrait involves some kind of manipulation, intentional or unintentional. No portrait exists without the indelible imprint of the person who made the portrait. This can be as simple as the conversation you had before. It can be the type of camera you're using. It can be the way you process the film, whatever it is. But every photographer brings themselves to every portrait as much as the subject brings themselves. Which one of these is true? Which one of these is real? Every one of these, I would say, says as much about the person who took it as it does about the subject. This is what Avedon said about it. All photographs are accurate. They're objective, but none are the truth. All right, great. Nice story, dude. <laughs> but like, what about interviewing? So I think maybe you know where I'm going with this. In the same way every photograph is as much about the photographer as it is about the subject, every interview is as much about the interviewer as it is about the candidate. If a photograph, which is like you could argue the most objective record of a subject you could hope to make, 
it can't, if it can't be true, what is? And I have to admit, this sent me into like a spiral of confusion. I was like, this was August. I was set up to give this talk in a couple of months. I'm also like on an interviewing work group at work. I do interviews. And I was just like, oh, like everything I thought was true is <laughs> crumbling around me. <laughs> but it also made me think of like, well, what are some things that I don't feel are crumbling around me? What are some things that I still believe are true? So first off, I believe in morality. I believe that we, as members of an industry which has a lot of power in the world, have a moral obligation to do the right thing. Like, in a constrained way, like, we should find candidates who will succeed and who will help us as an organization succeed. Uh, we should strive to remove biases from interviews. Our companies should reflect the diversity of the world we live in and the communities they operate in. And as Anil said in his keynote yesterday, we're in a position to decide who is allowed to create. And given the power our industry has in the world, that's a, that's a pretty big responsibility. And we should use that for good. Second, we should use kindness in our interviews. I've never doubted that. I've been in unkind interviews, um, certainly as a candidate, and sometimes like I'm sad to admit as an interviewer, and it sucks. Um, we shouldn't make candidates feel bad, and we shouldn't make interviewers feel bad. So these are true, but still, like these need to support something to actually work. Like these are great abstracts, but how do we make them work? We need to learn stuff about candidates. So a few days after my class, I was chatting with my friend Ian Malpass, who some of you know, as I often do when I find myself in an existential crisis. Uh, so I was talking to him, I described the problem, and he was like, you know, we write buggy code that we deploy on brittle servers, and it still works. It still pretty much works. We can build resilient and reliable systems even on stuff that falls apart in the individual case. Could we learn a lesson from that? I think we could. It all comes back to potatoes, of course. So we can think about iteration. Can we use iteration to improve our interviews? I think at the process level, we can think about how do we build processes that embrace change? Like we're gonna learn things about interviews, we're gonna learn how reliable they are, we're gonna learn things that can, we can tweak, but can we have a process which embraces that and doesn't calcify? Um, the thing that we've been doing at MailChimp for that is basically experimenting in smaller settings. So you can almost think about like a, a staging server for interviews. Um, we're hiring a lot of people in Oakland and we're trying out some new systems there. And then we'll, because we expect to learn things, we want to be able to change that quickly and then eventually mirror that up to the organization as a whole. Um, and that's been like, I think pretty successful and also like we have learned a lot. One of the things we're, we're practicing with is doing what we call choose your own adventure. Uh, so giving candidates the option of doing homework, coming on site for a pair programming interview, or submitting a code sample and discussing their code. And like it turns out there's a lot of like weird logistical little corners that if we tried to deploy that across all of MailChimp would have caused all sorts of problems. But in the constrained environment with people who are super excited about it, it's easy to experiment. The other thing is building individual iteration into the process, right? Like I would say if you're gonna interview and you're in a position to do it frequently, do it frequently because you're gonna learn things and you wanna be able to apply those things as soon as you can. Which leads us into observability. Uh, so at the process level, you can think about some observability like surveying candidates to see what their experience was like. Um, you could probably do surveys to see if you're biasing your recruiting process against underrepresented minorities or women. You can collect data. Um, if you have a process that allows you to do anonymized evaluation like homework, you can track that versus on sites and see if there's disparities that might point out biases. Another neat thing that, that Google did was because Google had a, a numerical score, they were able to build a histogram for every interviewer that showed the distribution of their scores up, up to that interview. So in hiring committee, we were able to look, and another neat thing is 
the bars on the histogram were colored, so you could describe, you could see like uh, basically there's like a blue bar if a candidate got hired. So if you saw a lot of blue bars skewing low, you could say, well, this interviewer tends to like give a low score generally, and then you could sort of normalize that with other feedback. Um, the other thing about observability is I think there's a lot of value in introspection before and after an interview. Like the mindset you bring to an interview, this goes back to the photography thing, will color the interview you have. And that's inevitable. And like you can't, you may not be able to knock yourself out of that, but you can at least write it down and acknowledge it and share it with the other people in the interview. So I had like, Last week, I had this amazing design session. We were thinking about like this new architecture for this thing I'm working on at work, and like it was exciting and fun. We were drawing diagrams and like thinking about all this cool stuff we could do. And then right after it, I had an interview, so I was fired up. Like I was just ready to go deep with like whoever. And it turned out to be a great interview, and I think it was a great interview objectively. But it is worth noting that mindset versus like oh, it's Friday afternoon, I'm tired, etc. Um, another thing is to uh, to the extent you can, have a shadow in every interview. And have that shadow's role be to evaluate the interview itself and not the candidate. So give feedback to the interviewer after the interview about what they saw. And that can be a great way for people who are newer to interviewing to learn about it in a less stressful way. But it's also fantastic for more for anyone. Um, an interview a couple of weeks ago, which was like, this is this like the smallest thing, but the shadow afterwards was like, hey, you know, when you type to take notes, we can hear it. So it was a video conference interview. So every time I typed, like in the conference room, they could hear clickety, 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 click, click. And I had no idea. Like I literally would not have known that unless she'd been there to tell me. So that's super powerful, um, even for little things like that. And finally, redundancy. So obviously you want to do multiple interviews per candidate. Uh, you want overlapping and redundant goals in those interviews. Like you, you think about there being error bars or noise or whatever, you can sort of try to minimize that by, by getting multiple data sources. Um, and add more redundancy for things your org thinks are most important. Um, you can, oh, another nice thing about redundancy is it's another great way to get uh, newer interviews up, interviewers up to speed. So you can staff more experienced interviewers whose data you trust more with people who are newer to it as a low risk way for them to practice and to sort of complement each other and learn from each other. Um, also be aware that individual questions you ask might answer more than one question. This sort of goes back to the mapping the potato and hitting the boundaries of the potato because then you're not just answering, oh, does this person know how DNS works at this granularity? But also, what do they do when they don't know how DNS works at this granularity? The other thing about that, too, to be aware of is like different people might react differently to the underlying question of what do you do when you don't know the answer to something based on the like who's asking it, the way it's asked, the, the arena in which it's being asked. Um, All right, so basically I think what that adds up to is craft and embracing the fact that interviewing is a craft and it takes practice and it takes intentionality. Um, and you have to embrace the humanity of it in all its unpredictable glory. Like we're never gonna make it a completely uh, rational like uh, algorithm. So on that note, remember that quote at the beginning? This is my, I apologize to Ms. Le Guin, who is legitimately my favorite author. This is my corruption of her quote. Um, and I think this is the key sort of at an individual level. Like you can't ask somebody, do you enjoy solving problems you don't know the answer to? I mean, you can, but like you might not get very reliable data out of it. But you can ask questions they don't know the answers to and observe. But, this is a quote from this amazing paper that my coworker Daniel sent to me. I'll just let you read that. <laughs> um, so interviewing is a human endeavor, and as such, we need to approach it with respect for the individual. Um, and I think this pathology, 
ties back into something that I think is very foundational, which is vulnerability in an interview. You're asking a candidate to be vulnerable, and to do that and to build that trust, you also need to be vulnerable. And I think times when I've found myself acting like a sadist during interviews were times when I have been afraid to let my guard down. I've been afraid that I'm gonna be outsmarted in an interview or somebody's gonna like humiliate me because I work at this place they wanna work but they know more than me. Well, like, guess what? 90% of the people I interview know more than me. Like, and that's actually fun. That's like the best thing in the world. Um, so your goal is to build an environment intentionally of kindness. And when I think about DevOps, like going back to DevOps, like really good DevOps practices are built on kindness. They're built on a just culture. They're predicated on this idea that everybody's doing their best. And we get the most information in a post-mortem or in an interview when we can be vulnerable. It's a two-way street. And the great news is that being vulnerable leads to empathy and trust. And the best interviews happen when there's mutual empathy and trust. And underlying all this, again, is morality. You have to have a moral compass. I think, in my mind, this is the true lesson of Avedon's portraits. As much as he manipulated them, he was operating from a place of morality. Um, and the solution to ambiguity and hard decisions isn't to trying to program anything out of the system. It's to be constantly aware of the moral implications of your decisions at every step. And if you like somehow magically were able to program bias out of interviewing, but your organization as a whole was still biased, it wouldn't matter. That would almost, almost be worse. So state your values around interviewing your organization and iterate towards them. And it has to transcend interviews and hiring. I think that part is profoundly difficult and profoundly good and the work of a lifetime. Thank you. Oh yeah, I'll take some questions. So are you, are you a full-time engineer or are you a full-time interviewer or do you balance I'm nominally a full-time engineer. Um, I think like at MailChimp, the role of principal engineer sort of means you get to be fluid between being heads down writing code and doing sort of other organizational projects. Um, I think that, I will say that even like as a, like an IC3 at Google, which is the level below, two levels below senior, um, I was doing interviews there. And like, I think the assumption generally is like you make time for it because it is super duper important. And I think the information you gather about a person who might be a, a future coworker is super important. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to. Like, I think there's an element of sort of pragmatism and like embracing the fact that your data is never going to be perfect, and a lot of the time it's not even good. Yeah. What are some of your favorite and most insightful questions that you ask? Um, so, it's a good question, uh, and I, I think they change a lot. Um, right now, like I'm. I've been sort of focused on like very technical hands-on coding questions. Um, so one of the ones I've been playing with is like, uh, you have a very simple subset of uh, markdown rules and just write a function to convert markdown to HTML. And like that, it's pretty straightforward. There's no trick to it. Like there's not some aha moment. It's just kind of practically like writing out stuff on the keyboard. Um, I think the, my, I hope I'm not giving anything away. This was many years ago. Uh, Eric Schmidt came to visit the Google office in Austin when I was working there. And like there were eight engineers, so we got to have like an hour of just chatting with the dude. Um, and of course, like we were talking about interviews all the time. So one of the engineers asked Eric, like, what's your favorite interview question? And his for like, this is clearly not an engineering interview, but his question was, tell me about everybody you've talked to today. Like, that was like a really neat, like your job as an executive is to be super engaged with people and now share that with me. So you get the communication and the observation and so on. Yeah. Uh, 
whenever you have headcount, like opens up once a year? Do you have any mechanisms or suggestions that are unsaturated? So, yeah, sorry. The, the question was, uh, I talked about iteration. What do you do if you only have headcount open up like once a year or so? Is there, is there a way to iterate? Um, I think doing mock interviews is actually super duper useful. And like even I think if you're doing one interview a week, doing mock interviews with people just to practice and to sort of like set your expectations. It's like here's somebody I work with and I know they're competent. How do they do on this question can be really useful. Also, like I don't know if this feels mercenary or weird, but like you can go interview at other companies and like see what they do and, <laughs> and sort of get some empathy as a candidate. So <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you mentioned experimenting on new journeys. How do you balance out the role of patients of essentially experimenting on people directly, which is critical to their livelihood and their career? Yeah, so the, the question to repeat it was I mentioned experimenting in interviews. Uh, so, how do you balance the moral implications of that where you like might be doing something which has a profound impact on an individual in their future career and so on against the idea of experimentation. I think in my head the way I think about that is like it's better than not experimenting, right? Like it's, um, if you go into it like hyper aware of exactly that dynamic and think about that dynamic in your, like as you set up these new things, like it's never, again, it's never gonna be perfect and like you, you're trying to approach something better. Um, and honestly, like we've shared that with candidates. Like, hey, we're trying something new. And like all the time in interviews, I say like, never asked this question before, so we're gonna have to work through it together. And like this is, yeah. Yeah. So at first I had a really positive reaction when you mentioned keeping people the option between submitting the code sample, being trouble at home, and um, pair coding. Because mm -hmm. I've become recently really mattering over the last few years with just having people do a problem, especially because you see how many people just don't even, we tell them what the right answer is and their output still would even be the right answer. But anyway, but so then I started thinking about it more when you were talking then, like, well, wait, but it's like they're not all doing the same problem. I mean, it seems to introduce a lot with like another backdoor for bias or another thing. Yeah, so the way I think about that is and the way we frame it is we want, like our goal is to let candidates show their strengths, right? Like we're not trying to trip candidates up or trick them into doing something they're not good at. Like we very explicitly want them to do the thing they're best at. And like part of, I think, a, a good strength is knowing how to show your strengths. And like, so that sort of factors into it. And like, again, um, there there is a difference and like you're not necessarily ranking everybody against the exact same rubric, but we, I think we have to accept that because not everybody does a great job the same way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the question was, how do you do mock interviews and remove the, the threat, basically, of somebody failing a mock interview? And, and for me, I think it really comes down to framing it. Um, and I think also, like, in, in some ways, making yourself vulnerable first. So a lot of the time, like, I will happily be a mock interview for a more junior candidate um, to sort of show that, like, I can do that. And, I, like, and it's very likely I'll, like, fail especially given you know, if you're mock interviewing a question, you might not know how well calibrated it is and so on. So, um, but I will say, like, when I was teaching interview training at Google, like, we did mock interviews, like the instructors interviewed each other. And man, like, getting up there on a whiteboard in front of like 15 other engineers and trying to, I don't know, choose your algorithm question in front of these people, it's terrifying. And you have the job, right? Like you're not gonna get fired, but it is. But I, and, but I think also there's value in the empathy that brings and remembering like I am terrified of this and I've already got the job and nobody's gonna fire me and this is still scary. So think about what it must feel like for a candidate. Yeah. 
the other strength. It's, it occurs to me that, that that goes for improving diversity. Yes, yeah. So the, the uh, question was that um, I talked about not using the same rubric and letting people show their strengths, and, and that might speak to diversity. And I think like that's very true and actually gets it um, a thing that I didn't include in this deck that I sort of wish I had, which is this idea of stereotype threat. So um, certain like underrepresented, this is, it manifests itself in underrepresented minorities, but the idea is that like if you're expected to fail, then you might have a lot more barriers around showing yourself as vulnerable. Like it, it's, it's like I as like, you know, a semi Asperger's-y bald white dude in tech, like I'm happy to walk into an interview room and fail, right? Like that's because I have been told since I was 12 that I could screw shit up and everything would be fine. But like not everybody, most people do not have that advantage. So when you think about like that, the goal of getting to I don't know, think about people's backgrounds and like how that might feel different to different people. Um, and, and like you said, like figure out a way to let people show their strengths. How do you uh, people to know how they align with your culture? Yeah, so the question was how do you interview people to know how they align with your culture? Um, I think like my first reaction to that is I'm not sure that aligning with the culture is the goal necessarily so much as complementing the culture or like bringing more value to the culture. Um, so I think like there are a lot of behavioral questions you can ask around that. Um, I think there are some really good questions you can ask around diversity and inclusion, like basically like have you thought about it? Have you been a proponent for it? Tell me about a time when you've been a proponent for that sort of thing. Um, but not everybody has those experiences, and sometimes you also need to observe. Like it goes back to, like, observing how people communicate, like how empathetic or kind they are as candidates during the interview. Um, but it's fuzzy. Yeah. Sometimes oh. Have an yes. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually a really good point. And so the the um, addition was sometimes you can have a pair of people, uh, like a more diverse panel. Um, I think the one dangerous thing about that is it can put a lot of onus on people who are already like being asked more of by the organization. So like if you ask, yeah, right, yeah, you understand that. You don't like the company with the diversity numbers, yeah. You could. One time a person that was like, oh, you don't look like a Barbie doll, but you do. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. So the question was, how do you balance between uh, specific technology questions and general problem solving skills? Um, I think, like honestly, it depends on your organization and like how much, uh, if you're an organization like say Google, which can invest years in like teaching people and ramping people up, then the particular skills might not matter as much. Um, but if you are an organization where some, like you're a startup and somebody needs to jump in and like commit code and like be making huge progress on the first day, you're gonna skew more towards skills. Yeah. 